I begin with a question. Is the 9-11 Commission's new story about American 77 believable? One of the things that we would not have expected on the assumption that we have been told the truth about American 77 is that three years after 9-11, the original official story about this flight would be replaced with a radically different story. According to the original story, told in a press release of September 18th, 2001, called NORAD's Response Times, NORAD was notified about American 77 at 9.24 that morning, roughly 14 minutes before the Pentagon was officially hit. This report raised a difficult question for the military. Why were the F-16s from Langley Air Force Base, about 130 miles away, not able to get to the Pentagon in time to prevent the attacks? In their 2006 book, the co-chairs of the 9-11 Commission, Thomas Kane and Lee Hamilton, wrote, if the military had had the amount of time they said they had, it was hard to figure out how they failed to shoot down the plane. The 9-11 Commission would avoid this conclusion by providing a new story, according to which the FAA had not told the military about American 77 at 924. In fact, the Commission claimed it never did notify the military until the Pentagon had been struck. This new official story of 2004 by the 9-11 Commission got the military off the hook for not prevented the preventing the attack on the Pentagon. But this new story is not believable for many reasons. The FAA's Air Traffic Control Center in Indianapolis was handling the flight when it started showing signs of being in trouble. The 9-11 Commission claims that the Indianapolis Center did not notify the military even when, at 8.56, it lost this flight's transponder signal, its radar track, and its radio. Why? Because the Indian Indianapolis controller concluded, the 9-11 Commission claimed, that American 77 had experienced serious electrical or mechanical failure after which it crashed. Why would the controller have made this conclusion at this time when it was known that two planes had already been hijacked, one of which had crashed into the World Trade Center? Because, the Commission claimed, no one at Indianapolis had any knowledge of the situation in New York until 9.20. But this claim strains credulity. Television networks had started broadcasting images of the World Trade Center at 8.48. These images included, at 9.03, the crash of the second airliner into the South Tower. Millions of people knew about these events. How can we believe that no one at the Indianapolis Center had any knowledge of the situation in New York until 9.20? General Mike Canavan, Director at, of Civil Aviation Security, told the 9-11 Commission, as soon as you know you had a hijacked aircraft, you notify everyone. The notification gets broadcast out to all the regions. According to the 9-11 Commission report, Dick Cheney entered the bunker under the White House, technically the PIOC, the Presidential Emergency Operations Center, shortly before 10 o'clock, perhaps at 9.58. However, according to virtually all reports, including statements by Richard Clark and David Bohr, Cheney's photographer, Cheney had entered the PIOC closer to 9.15 a.m. The most important of these reports came from Norman Mineta, who was the Secretary of Transportation. In testimony to the 9-11 Commission, Mineta said that he arrived at the PIOC at about 9.20 a.m., shortly after which he overheard, overheard the ongoing conversation involving Cheney, which occurred during the time that the airplane was coming into the Pentagon. Mineta said, 
there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the plane is 50 miles out. The plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, the young man also said to the vice president, do the order still stand? And the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the order still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? What were the orders? Mineta assumed, he said, that they were orders to have the aircraft shot down. But no aircraft approaching Washington was shot down. Mineta's interpretation also made the young man's question unintelligible. Given the fact that the airspace over the Pentagon is categorized as forbidden, meaning that commercial aircraft are never permitted in it, plus the fact that the two hijacked planes had already crashed into the Twin Towers, the expected orders, if an unidentified plane were approaching the airspace, would have been to shoot it down. Had Cheney given those orders, there would have been no reason for the young man to ask if the order still stood. His question made sense only if the orders were to do something unexpected, not to shoot it down. The most natural interpretation of Mineta's story, accordingly, was that he had inadvertently reported that he heard Chena, Cheney confirm stand-down orders. This interpretation would also make sense of what the 9-11 Commission did in response to Mineta's story. Its report did not mention Mineta's story, and its claim that Cheney entered the PIOC shortly before 10 o'clock meant that there was no time for the exchange with the young man described by Mineta. This portion of Mineta's testimony was also removed from the Commission's video archive. Mineta's testimony, combined with the 9-11 Commission's reaction to it, provides strong evidence convic convincing to at least most members of the truth movement that Washington insiders, including Cheney, were behind the Pentagon attack. The official story is rendered especially dubious by its claim that the Pentagon was struck by a Boeing 757 flown by Al-Qaeda's Al Hani Hanjour as the title of a New York Times story revealed in 2002. Hanjour, who had been taking lessons in a single engine plane, was known as a trainee noted for incompetence, about whom an instructor said he could not fly at all. And yet on September 11, 2001, before Hanjour had been clarified by uh, uh, declared by authorities to have been the pilot of the plane that hit the Pentagon, a Washington Post story said, just as the plane seemed to be on a suicide mission into the White House, the unidentified pilot executed a pivot so tight that it reminded, obs reminded observers of a fighter jet maneuver. Aviation sources said the plane was flown with extraordinary skill. A post story the following year stated, aviation experts concluded that the final maneuver of American Flight 77 was the work of a great talent. This was clearly impossible. Moreover, the extraordinary maneuver would have been so difficult in a 757 that the official story could not be saved by simply choosing a less incompetent Al-Qaeda trainee. Ralph Kolstad, who was a top U.S. Navy pilot before becoming a commercial airline pilot, has said, I have 6,000 miles of flight time in Boeing 757s and 767s, and I could not have flown it the way the path was described. If the maneuver could not have been executed by a 757, by one of America's top pilots, it could not have been executed by one of the alleged hijackers. Turning now to United Flight 93, there were contradictory reports. In 2003, NORAD officials told the 9-11 Commission that the FAA reported a possible hijack of United Fl Flight 93 at 9:16. But the 9-11 Commission in 2004 called this incorrect, saying instead, by, by 10:03. 
when United 93 crashed in Pennsylvania, there had been no mention to the military of its hijacking. The FAA controller in Cleveland had detected signs of hijacking at 928, even hearing, we have a bomb on board. And yet Cleveland reportedly did not re uh, connect the military. The 9-11 Commission, trying to explain why not, gave an account of incompetence and even stupidity in the FAA, which is unbelievable. Besides being unbelievable, the 9-11 Commission's claim was contradicted by many prior reports. In his 2004 book, Richard Clark said that during his White House video conference, FAA Administrator Jane Garvey reported that at about 9.35, a number of potential hijacks, which included United 93 over Pennsylvania, had occurred. And this happened, this conversation occurred while both Donald Rumsfeld and General Richard Myers had been listening. The 9-11 Commission was able to claim that the military learned uh, or was able to deny that the military had learned about uh, Garvey's report by simply denying that Rumsfeld and Myers were involved in this video conference. An ABC program on the first anniversary of 9-11 had Carl Rove, David Bohr, Cheney's photographer, and Cheney himself discussing the hijacked United 93 as having been considered the biggest threat. Brigadier General Montague Winfield, who had taken a leadership position in the Pentagon's National Military Command Center, recalled, we received the report from the FAA that Flight 93 had turned off its transponder, had turned, and was now heading towards Washington, D.C. General Larry Arnold, the commander of NORAD's U.S. Continental Region, indicated in a January 2002 interview that the military learned about United 93's troubles between the crash into the second tower and the attack on the Pentagon. By this time, he said, we were watching United 93 wander around Ohio. He also said that at 924, our focus was on United 93, which was being pointed out to us very aggressively, I might add, by the FAA. This report by Arnold, who was involved in the events, differed radically from what the 9-11 Commission claimed. It's claimed that the FAA never contacted the military about United 93. Did the military shoot United 93 down? Rumors that the military had shot down Flight 93 existed from the start. Major Daniel Nash, one of the pilots from Otis Air Force Base, sent to fly over New York City, reported that when he returned to base, he was told that a military F-16 had shot down an airliner in Pennsylvania. This rumor became sufficiently widespread that it came up during General Richard Myers' confirmation interview with the Senate Armed Service Committee on September 13th. Chairman Carl Levin saying that there have been statements that the aircraft that crashed in Pennsylvania was shot down added, these stories continue to exist. Myers replied, Mr. Chairman, the armed forces did not shoot down any aircraft. That same day, NORAD said, Contrary to media reports that speculate that United Airlines Flight 93 was downed by a U.S. Mil uh, fighter aircraft, NORAD allocated forces have not engaged with weapons, any aircraft, including Flight 93. NORAD said that this should put an end to the rumors. But the rumors continued. Although the 9-11 Commission did not directly acknowledge this controversy, it made a three-point argument to rule out the possibility that United 93 could have been shot down. The first argument was that the military did not know uh, about the hijacking of United 93 until after it had crashed. 
as we have seen, there is much evidence against this claim. The second argument was that Cheney, having not arrived in the PIOC until almost 10 o'clock, did not give the shoot-down authorization until sometime after 10.10, .10, and that Richard Clark, who had asked for this authorization, did not receive confirmation until 10.25. These claims were meant to rule out the possibility that United 93 was shot down because it came down at either 10.03 or 10.06. However, Clark himself indicated that he, after asking for the authorization shortly after 9.30, and he was then amazed at the speed of the decisions coming from Cheney, and he received the authorization between 9.45 and 9.50, not after 10.10. The Pentagon's third argument was that the military was not in position to shoot United 93 down. But a reporter in Nashua, which is where the Boston Aircraft uh, Control Center actually is, wrote, FAA air traffic controllers in Nashua have learned through discussions with other controllers that the F-16 fighter stayed in hot pursuit of another hijacked commercial airliner until it crashed in Pennsylvania. Deputy Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz said, we responded awfully quickly, and in fact, we were already tracking in on that plane that crashed in Pennsylvania. A CBS story then said, US officials were considering shooting down the hijacked airliner that crashed in Western Pennsylvania, but it crashed first. Administration officials say that had the jetliner continued towards Washington, the fighter jets would have shot it down. The falsity of the official story about 93 is further suggested by descriptions of the alleged crash site. One television reporter said, there was just a big hole in the ground. All I saw was a crater filled with small charred plane parts, nothing that would even tell you that it was the plane. There were no suitcases, no recognizable plane parts, no body parts. A newspaper photographer said, I didn't think I was in the right place. I was looking for something that said tall, tail, wing, plane, uh, metal. There was nothing. Debris instead was found many miles away, and much of it was debris that could not have blown there. John Flegel, an uh, employee at Indian Lake Marina, reported that the debris that washed ashore included pieces of seats, small chunks of melted plastic, and checks. Newspapers reported that debris was found in New Baltimore, which was beyond a mountain ridge more than eight miles uh, from the alleged crash site. Also, although Flight 93 reportedly was carrying more than 30 7,000 gallons of fuel when it crashed, tests of uh, soil and groundwater at the official crash site found no evidence of contamination. Perhaps the strangest feature of the crash site was that there were evidently two of them. According to CNN reporter Brian Cabell, speaking from the official crash site, the FBI had cordoned off a second area about six to eight miles away from the crater. He then asked, why would debris from the plane be located six miles away? Conclusion. My report shows that there are many anomalous features in the official stories of Flight 77 and 93. Thank you very much for your kind attention. There's now a consensus, even from the staff of the 9-11 Commission, that there's something very wrong with the government story. 9-11 uh, Commission team leader John Farmer has said there was either unprecedented administrative incompetence or organized mendacity on the part of key figures in Washington. 
Now, the mendacity has come from figures including President Bush, Vice President Cheney, NORAD General Richard Myers, and CIA Director Tenet. They include also President Clinton's national security advisor, Samuel Berger, who prior to testifying on these matters, went to the National Archives and removed and presumably destroyed key relevant documents. Finally, in his book, John Farmer comes down to endorsing both of his alternatives. Farmer's first alternative of unprecedented administrative incompetence is in effect the explanation offered by the 9-11 report to deal with A, striking anomalies on 9-11 itself, and B, the preceding 20 months during which important information was withheld from the FBI by key personnel in the CIA's bin Laden unit, the so-called Alex Station. But thanks to the groundbreaking new book by Kevin Fenton, Disconnecting the Dots, we can no longer attribute the anomalous CIA behavior before 9-11 to, quote, systemic problems or what Anthony Summers rashly calls bureaucratic confusion. Fenton demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was a systematic CIA pattern of withholding important information from the FBI, even when the FBI would normally be entitled to it. The pattern begins with intelligence obtained from surveillance of an important Al-Qaeda summit meeting of January 2000 in Malaysia, perhaps the only such Al-Qaeda summit before 9-11. The meeting drew instant and high-level U.S. attention because of indirect links to a support element, a key telephone in Yemen used by Al-Qaeda, suspected of a role in the 1998 bombings of U.S. embassies. As Fenton notes, the CIA realized that the summit was so important that information about it was briefed to CIA and FBI leaders, Louis Free and Dale Watson, National Security Advisor Sandy Berger, and other top officials. This is probably what Berger was trying to cover up when he went to the archives. Yet inside Alex Station, Tom Wilshire and his CIA subordinate, known only as Michelle, blocked the effort of an FBI agent detailed there, Doug Miller, to notify the FBI that one of the participants, Khalid al mihdar had a U.S. visa in his passport. Alex Station also failed to watch list the participants in the meeting, as was called for by the CIA's guidelines. This was just the beginning of a systematic, sometimes lying pattern where NSA and CIA information about al Nista and his traveling companion, Nawaf al-Hazmi, was systematically withheld from the FBI, lied about, or manipulated or distorted in such a way as to inhibit an FBI investigation of the two Saudis and their associates. This pattern is a major component of the 9-11 story because the behavior of these two eventual hijackers was so unprofessional that without this CIA protection from the Alex Station Group, they would almost certainly have been detected and detained or deported long before they boarded Flight 77 in Washington. And so, I may add, would have been the other hijackers with whom they had been in contact. Initially, I believe al Mihdar and Al-Hazmi were protected because they had been sent to America by Saudi GID intelligence service, admitted under the terms of the liaison agreement between the GID and the CIA. Prince Turki al Faisal, former head of the GID, has said that he shared his al Qaeda information with the CIA and that in 1997 the Saudis, quote, established a joint intelligence committee with the United States to share information on information in, on terrorism in general and on al Qaeda in particular.
Even in the very best of circumstances, decisions have to be made whether to allow an informant's crime to go forward or to thwart it and risk terminating the usefulness of the informant. In such moments, agencies are all too likely to make the choice that is not in the public interest. A very relevant example is the first World Trade Center bombing of 1993. Relevant because Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the alleged mastermind of 9-11, was one of the 1993 plotters as well. The FBI had an informant, Ahmad Salem, among the plotters. And Salem later claimed, with supporting evidence from actual tapes of his FBI debriefings, that the FBI deliberately chose not to shut down the plot. Here is Ralph Blumenthal's careful account in the New York Times of this precursor to the mystery of 9-11. Law enforcement officials, the FBI, were told that terrorists were building a bomb that was eventually used to blow up the World Trade Center, and they planned to thwart the plotters by secretly substituting harmless powder for the explosives, comma, an informer said after the blast, that is, Ahmad Salim. The informer was to have helped the plotters build the bomb and supply the fake powder, but the plan was called off by an FBI supervisor who had other ideas about how the informer Ahmad Salim should be used. What makes the 1993 bombing even more relevant is that Salim, according to many sources, was an agent of the Egyptian intelligence service sent to America under liaison to spy on the actions of the Egyptian blind sheikh Omar Achdel Rahman. It is clear from both investigative and prosecutorial behavior that a number of different US agencies did not want to disturb Rahman's activities. Even after Rahman himself was finally indicted in the 1995 conspiracy case to blow up New York landmarks, the U.S. government continued to protect Ali Mohammed, a key figure, perhaps the key figure in that conspiracy. Then in 1994, when Ali Mohammed was detained in Vancouver by da -da -da -da, the Canadian RCMP, the, the FBI intervened to arrange for Ali Mohammed's release. This freed Mohammed to proceed to Kenya, where he became the lead organizer of the 1998 embassy bombing in Nairobi. Following this atrocity, Ali Mohammed was finally belatedly detained by the Americans, but still not indicted. He was apparently still a free man when he readily confessed to his FBI handler, Jack Clunan, that he knew at least three of the 9-11 hijackers and had helped instruct them in how to hijack airplanes. We have to conclude that there is something profoundly dysfunctional going on here and has been going on since before 9-11, indeed under both political parties. We know from many accounts of the Bush administration that there was also another powerful pro-war consensus within it, centered on Cheney, Rumsfeld, and the so-called cabal of PNAC, the project for the new American century, that before Bush's election had been lobbying vigorously and publicly for military action against Iraq. We know also that Rumsfeld's immediate response to 9-11 was to propose an attack on Iraq, and that planning for such an attack was indeed instituted on September the 17th. In the Bush administration, Stephen Cambone, who earlier had collaborated with Rumsfeld and Cheney in signing the PNAC statement, Rebuilding America's Defenses, became one of the most active promoters of using SOCOM special forces to operate covertly against Al-Qaeda, not just in Afghanistan, but, quote, anywhere in the world, which is, in effect, what we have now under, uh, under our current president. 
In a sense, 9-11 was unprecedented, the greatest mass murder ever committed in one day on U.S. soil. In another sense, it represented a kind of event with which we have become only too familiar since the Kennedy assassination. I've called these events deep events, events with a predictable accompanying pattern of official cover-ups backed up by amazing media malfunction and dishonest best-selling books. Some of these deep events, like the Kennedy assassination and 9-11, should be considered structural deep events because of their permanent impact on history. It is striking that these two structural events, the Kennedy assassination and 9-11, should both have been swiftly followed by America's engagement in ill-considered wars. The reverse is also true. All of America's significant wars since Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, twice, once covertly and now overtly, and Iraq, have all been preceded by structural deep events. America, I argue in my latest book, has become dominated by a war machine in Washington, a war machine that has been building incrementally since Eisenhower warned us about it in 1961. I thank you very much. Of war and humanity, in the utter madness of militarism, Dr. Martin Luther King had this to say more than 40 years ago about his responsibility to challenge his own government regarding its war on Vietnam. A time comes when silence is betrayal. That time has come for us. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in a time of war. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. I'm here to speak to you about the betrayal of truth that still continues today and to break the silence about events that present a profound challenge to our most closely guarded beliefs about government and democracy. The public's attention must be brought to bear upon the state crimes against democracy related to the events of September 11, 2001. These events collectively are referred to as state crimes against democracy or SCADs. State crimes against democracy are actions which are undertaken in direct violation of sworn oaths of office by officials in order to circumvent, exploit, undermine or subvert laws, the constitutional order, or the public awareness essential to popular control of government. SCADs are dangerous to democracy because they are not isolated events, but a pattern of actions, or in some cases, inactions, which facilitate a progression towards closing down an open and free society into a police state run by a select few. Although there are many theories as to why some people refuse to look at evidence that the official account is false, they're not all equally valid theories. It is neither valid nor accurate to claim that just because a person will not examine evidence that the official account is false, that they are simply in denial. The human brain is the most complex organism in the body, and thus the mechanisms by which the mind processes, interprets, and responds to information is equally complex. For example, the human brain is composed of hundreds of billions of neurons, each with thousands of synapses, creating a vastly complex and intricate neural network consisting of up to a hundred trillion to up to a quadrillion synaptic connections. At any one time, this organ, this organ is processing an infinite amount of information, both from its internal and external environment, most of which we are unconscious of. However, it is often that information, of which we are largely unaware, that has the most significant influence over our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Even those thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that we adamantly believe to be consciously determined. We assume that when we are looking at something, we are consciously analyzing it based upon the visual information that is entering the brain from the eyes. But this is not entirely accurate. 
In fact, visual stimuli transduced by the rods and cones in the eyes and sent by electrochemical signals to the central nervous system via the optic nerves does not go directly to the occipital cortex, which is the primary region responsible for processing visual information. Instead, it first goes to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, another region of the brain that is a part of the limbic system and important to emotional arousal. To put this in simpler terms, this means that you can experience an emotional reaction to something before you are consciously aware that you have even seen it, which in turn then affects how you see it. Alternative explanations of political assassinations, terrorist attacks, and other national tragedies that differ from official state accounts are sometimes dismissed by the general public because they evoke strong cognitive dissonance, a psychological phenomenon which occurs when new ideas or information conflict with previously formed ideologies and accepted beliefs. In psychology, a false belief generally refers to one that has been manipulated often purposely and outside of the per person's awareness, and sometimes in a very specific direction or misdirection. Um, an elegant and robust example comes from the work of Solomon Ash in the 1940s and Harold Kelly in the 1950s, and later replicated by others, including Neil Widmeyer and John Loy in the, in the late 1980s. And uh, uh, Widmeyer and Loy's paper is the one that I'm gonna be focusing on. Uh, this experimental manipulation of beliefs is referred to as the warm-cold effect. In a classroom setting, students in Widmeyer and Loy's experiment were given different introductions to a visiting professor and later asked to, to describe the professor and his lecturing abilities. But before the professor appeared, half of the students were informed that he was a rather cold person and the other half were informed that he was a rather warm person. In addition, students in both groups were also told that the professor, that he was either a professor of physical education or a professor of social psychology. All the students experienced the exact same lecture, which was delivered in a very neutral manner. Okay? The results showed that students who were led to believe that the lecturer was a warm person not only reported that he was much more likable then students led to believe he was a cold person. They also reported that he was a more competent teacher. This is an example of a false belief because the liking or disliking and the perceptions of competency and incompetency arose from the warm or cold introduction and not from the professor's actual mannerisms or methods of teaching, which were all identical for students. Most importantly, the information regarding the professor's area of expertise as either a professor of physical, physical education or social psychology had no effect on students' perceptions. Now, this experimental example has real-world consequences for a functioning democracy, such as when people can be manipulated, for example, by the media into falsely believing that they like or dislike a presidential candidate because of his or her public policy, when in fact the perception arises solely from the media's framing of the candidate merely as likable or dislikable. The issue of competency to hold the highest position of public office does not even need to factor into the equation. The use of repression and terror, including threats of censorship, suppression of information, imprisonment and torture by leaders to silence political opponents and dissidents is not exclusive to authoritarian states. Such tactics can also be employed by leaders of democratic states, a fact that can be difficult for people to acknowledge, especially if it is not consistent with their belief system. We must be ever vigilant of the motives of leaders who would persuade us to surrender our property, liberty, and humanity one priceless piece at a time. How can we do this? First and foremost, by educating ourselves and our fellow citizens on how we, the people, can be manipulated by our government and its lapdog news media into forfeiting our civil liberties and duties. We need to challenge the long-standing and often erroneous assumptions about the role of government, public discourse, and dissent in democratic societies. And we can start by identifying some of the social, social psychological factors that can prevent people from examining evidence of crimes committed by the state. Although some people may harbor cynicism about bureaucrats and politicians, most do not want to believe that public officials in general, and especially those at the highest office, would participate in election tampering, assassinations, mass murder, or other high crimes, especially in democratic societies. For example, although public cynicism towards government was high in the months prior to 9-11, 
Trust in U.S. officials in Washington rose significantly. It more than doubled to 64% in the weeks following the terrorist attacks, suggesting that heightened focus on national security breeds support for incumbent fo foreign policymakers. Claims that state intelligence and other officials within democratic states could conspire with criminal elements to kill civ innocent civilians are difficult for citizens of those states to comprehend, even when backed by substantial evidence. Evidence that U.S. officials have used the attacks of 9-11 as a means to manipulate the mass public into accepting two major wars of aggression has been dangerously ignored by mainstream media and academia until recently. Protecting democracy demands that citizens must be made aware of how they can be manipulated by government and media into forfeiting their civic liberties and duties. Information vital to protecting citizens from crimes against democracy orchestrated by the state, as history has repeatedly demonstrated, can happen particularly in times of disaster, collective shock, and national threat. I want to end with uh, one important quote from Dr. Martin Luther King, who I opened up with that is just imperative today and perhaps even more so than when he said it. We must move past indecision to action. We must find new ways to speak for peace in Vietnam and justice throughout the developing world, a world that borders on our doors. If we do not act, we shall surely be dragged down the long, dark, and shameful corridors of time reserved for those who possess power without compassion, might without morality, and strength without sight. Now let us begin. Now let us rededicate ourselves to the long and bitter, but beautiful, struggle for a new world. This is the calling of the sons of God and our brothers wait eagerly for our response. Shall we say the odds are too great? Shall we tell them the struggle is too hard? Will our message be that the forces of American life militate against their arrival as full men and we send our deepest regrets? Or will there be another message of longing, of hope, of solidarity with their yearnings, of commitment to their cause, whatever the cost? The choice is ours, and though we might prefer it otherwise, we must choose in this crucial moment of human history. Thank you. One of the most important things to understand is, from my point of view, how I got here and, uh, and why I'm here. Because I don't take the same position of the scientific community that's, that I behold. What I behold is that this knowledge has to get out to the people. And, and you need an actionable item. And I want to give you one statement about my experience because I get it all the time. Well, we got to inform the people. We got to do this for the people. Keep in mind, if the people have no vehicle, no vehicle to act upon that information, all you do is create a new generation of cynics. That's all that happens. When you have information as a citizen, you must have a vehicle to act upon it. The people, without the ability to make law, are disenfranchised. And I tell you that as a politician because I got elected, several elections in fact, and I'll tell you very candidly how it works. I get money from special interest, I turn around and manipulate you, my constituency, and after you elect me, I look down at you and say, hell, I'm smarter than all of you. I just fooled you, I got elected. That is the way it works. That is the way it works. And so when people say, I can't believe that our leadership would be so criminal to, be, to, to cause 3,000 deaths, my God, realize that that's what they're always doing. Ever since I've been in public office, the leadership of my country that I love, your country and the world, we've just been killing people wantonly. I came to the conclusion that the answer uh, and I came to this conclusion totally. I was grappling with it for more than a decade, and that is that the answer lies with the people. Very simple. There's only two venues for change. The government, wherein lies the problem, or the people. The problem is the people don't have the power to act upon 
the knowledge that they receive and what they continue. So I wrote legislation. It's called the National Initiative. This initiative is a device, meta-legislation. I don't care about the issue. Meta-legislation to empower you to make laws in every government jurisdiction of the United States, and I hope someday in every jurisdiction, government jurisdiction of the world. The people then would come in as partners, full partners with their representatives, who will then be in a position to do a better job in their representation, because we need good leaders, but the people will be the policy makers. And the minute they come into that scene, they are the senior partners. I was there on 9-11 with a three-day funk depression glued to, to the TV. Now, why did I know right then and there that the fix was in? Well, I knew it. I've been following the military-industrial complex and fighting them for the last 40 years. 9-11 generated three wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the most diabolical one of all, which will finance into infinity the military-industrial complex. That's the war on terror, because terror was with us at the beginning of civilization, and it will be with us at the end of civilization. Let me reemphasize uh, Cicero's great statement. Keep in mind, when he was around, Cicero said, Freedom is participation in power. If you do not make laws, none of you have ever participated in power unless you've been elected to office. I've participated in power, and what I saw was terrible. was terrible. I've got the backing and the acceptance of this law, which has never been done before, by California, by Oregon, and now by Massachusetts. It's locked in. It's locked in. <laughs> Hello, my name is Bob McElveen. Uh, I live in Philadelphia, the suburbs of Philadelphia. My son Bobby, almost 10 years ago, died right here at the site of the North Tower on September 11, 2001. Bobby lived up at 66 between 1st and 2nd and took the subway to Fulton Street and walked over from Fulton Street where he had just started a job at Merrill Lynch. He had just started there like two, three weeks before 9-11. And um, so my assumption is that day, we had no idea what happened to Bobby, but we came up to New York and we did find his body. We took Bobby home that week and buried him on a week later on Tuesday the 18th. For years and years, I've been trying to find out what happened that day. But in the beginning, uh, things were so frantic, you spend almost a year just grieving because you just can't figure out what happened. But I questioned the story of 9-11 immediately, but again, I, I just wasn't getting involved in that too much. I went to all, most of the 90% of the 9-11 commission hearings. Well, my whole life changed after Condoleezza Rice uh, testified, and I, I don't call it testimony. As far as the case of uh, Condoleezza Rice, it was a filibuster. Uh, they were questioning her about this August 6th memo that Osama bin Laden was supposed to attack the United States. And of course, I assume everyone knows what a filibuster is, but she just talked nonsense. And each commissioner only had five minutes to speak up or to ask questions. Well, anyway, that ended. Nothing was said. Nothing was done. All the commissioners were Saran and Condoleezza Rice shaking her hands, everyone smiling. And that's when I lost my cool. It was after that that I, I did an interview. I was angry, and I've been angry ever since. I realized the investigation was a total sham, and I think everyone in the world knows that the investigation was a total sham. Even the commissioners admit that, some of the commissioners admit that it was a sham. So I've dedicated my life since then to just concentrating on 9-11 truth. You're having hearings up in Toronto. I, I just think it's such a wonderful thing because it's going to put this information out to hopefully the whole world. And from that, maybe we would have a nonpartisan objective investigation for a constant war. And it's based on what happened that day, what happened that morning. And these are explosions that took place. So I really wish you luck in Toronto. 
My spirit is with you, but my family, we're here at Ground Zero every September 11th. So I will be thinking of you, and I just want you all to stay strong and do your thing. Thank you.